and welcome. Welcome to February and the month of COVID-19. Indeed it is. Uh, Greetings. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Happy Valentine's Day from your local virus. Exactly. This is the Mark and Carrie Show, in case you're wondering, or if you're waiting for another episode of General Hospital, you're definitely on the wrong channel. So, virus, what's up? Well, I mean, there's so many different ways to think about this, because, of course, there's the political side of things. So yesterday, for example, I think it was yesterday, the day before, it's hard to keep track of time these days, uh, that the president said that it's, go- it's going to be fine, the U.S. is prepared. Meanwhile, his secretaries of health and human services were and CDC were um, testifying before the Senate to say prepare for like 15 to 18 million Americans to get it, I And think. also getting stuff flatly wrong about the lethality in comparison with the flu, yes, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. And asking for like $11 billion trillion, but having no real sense of why they need the money or what is happening. Um, so there's that side of that. There's the economic um, impact side. And then there's just that Americans just do like hysteria really well. I mean, every day, they're well, not even... It's updated minute by minute, like what the number increase in number is. Yep, around exactly. The world. It is a kind of you know too much information problem. Yes. Yeah. So it's also been spreading. So there's a large outbreak in Iran. Yes. Right. Yeah. Which you'd think that sort of some people in Trump administration would be quite pleased about <laughs> yeah. actually, yes. but you know that's the thing about bio weapons; they don't stop at borders. And uh, not to say that this is not going down the conspiracy theory hole there. Just want to be you. Cl- Clar- thank yeah, you very much. Clarify. Uh, and then of course in Italy. Yeah. which basically means that the European Union and the whole Schengen freedom of movement thing is going yeah. to come into question. Um, the Brits have the channel. I'm quite sure that Boris will have no compunction whatsoever at closing borders at certain points. And the water's cold. And if we go by Trump's rationale, like it can't survive in cold. Or no, it's warm water. Is it warm, warm water. Water? It's is warm, it warm weather, weather that kills it. Sorry. Oh, okay. So cold water won't. China's quite warm, isn't it, sometimes? Sometimes, but in the summer, the president thinks it'll get better because okay, of the warm good. weather. Yeah, right. really? He did really say that one? Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. Um, sorry, so what do we really know about this thing? All right, we don't really know much. And here's why. What you really need to be concerned with, because I've done a bit of work on this, is the lethality rate, yes. right? And the lethality rate is kind of a sum. So you put kind of deaths on the top and then mm-hmm. infections on the bottom. And there are some reports that this virus has been kicking around China a lot longer than we hitherto thought. I was wondering. You, they're so secretive. And But not just the secretive, because it could be the case that a very large number of these cases are asymptomatic. Oh, God. So people might have had it. Yeah. Nobody knew. And it wasn't until you started basically croaking lots of people over 80, which is basically where the lethality hits, that you kind of identify this as a thing, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. Now, what that means is, if you will, is the, sort of the denominator could be much lower larger than we thought, which means that the lethality overall goes down. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right? a good point, so, right. So that could be a good thing, right? Yeah. The other one is that could all be wrong. Yeah. And what we're seeing in Iran, for example, what we're seeing in Italy is a relatively small number of people and relative to that, quite a large number of deaths. Mm-hmm. So if you basically, here's the two things that we do know, and these numbers, of course, could change. So the expected probability of death mm-hmm. is basically concentrated, it's about 14 to 15% amongst people over 80. Right? Oh, so it really is an elderly, really is, not right? a kid. It's okay. not a kid killer, right? It's not W-shaped as it yeah. was with the uh, the flu virus of yeah. uh, 1914, 1918, yes. yep. 1918, 1920, which was kids got it, middle-aged people didn't, then old right. people got it. This one's just yeah. an old person yeah. killer. So we do seem to know this. But here's a, a very scary way to think about this. Imagine that this is a 2% lethality and it's mm-hmm. concentrated at the end of the scale, right? And then you've got some public health systems are much better than others. I mean, think about when this goes through Africa or places Well, like I was this. thinking refugee camps too. Refugee I mean, camps, exactly, geez. right? So let's say t- with 7 billion people in the world and a 2% fatality rate is somewhere in the region of 220 million people. Jeez. Yeah. That's what happens when you've got a very large number of people on a very small planet yeah. all sharing the same sort of space. Yeah. Well, so uh, one thing that I have been thinking of is it seems like China, from the political standpoint, was increasing numbers and artificially increasing them to then say that numbers had gone down. I just on the it just seems like there's a lot of fuzzy math going on, and I wonder if Xi Jinping, how long he can stay in control, or if the party's like, see you later, and they like take him out back. I just, I, I'm the political implications within China seem really interesting to me. So the, so the, another thing that we do know is the transmission rate, right? Mm-hmm. So that tends to be above, very infectious, above right. three, which means that every one person who gets it tends to infect three people. To get this down, you basically have to get it below one. 
Yeah. Now, the only way that you do this is mass quarantine. So it may be the case that basically, and I think somebody at the WHO said this in the past few hours. Yeah. uh, I don't want to misquote, but basically it was only China could do this. Only China could put London under lockdown, which is essentially what putting Wuhan under lockdown does. Now, if you're in a much more sort of porous society... Yeah. less hierarchically governed. What's the chance of shutting down a major city in Western Europe? Well, that's, I mean, in the US, right? Right, absolutely. I mean, that, that's the panic, yeah. Exactly. But at the same time, we don't know. Let's remember, right? Think of the market reaction on this. What yeah. is it markets hate? They hate uncertainty. Right. And what we're doing here is we're generating lots of news that's going to be contradicted because we don't really know the facts. Something's out there. It could be bad, but we don't know. So what right. you're seeing is people going into fly- safety assets. Yeah. They're buying gold. They're buying bonds. Yeah. They're moving out of buying stocks. They're getting out of leveraged debt. <laughs> yeah. Probably sensible anyway, right? And uh, yeah, you know, so we don't know. But, you know, we, we like everyone else, we will monitor development. Should I be buying face masks or gloves? I mean, uh, I think gloves, right, is about washing your hands. Yeah, more it's than... about washing your hands a lot, you know, hand sanitizer, etc. Yeah. The masks one is terribly misunderstood. The whole point of the mask is if you have it, you wear yeah. one and you don't give it to someone else. People are panicked by masks and walking around with masks, which yeah. basically means you breathe through your mouth, which then creates this yeah. giant Petri dish of possibilities for any bugs behind the mask. So you're actually increasing your chance of, if not getting this, right. getting something right. by wearing a mask when you don't have it. But, you know, you can't tell people. Though I do like the masks that are very fashion forward and they have like rhinestones on them. I mean, people are really leaning leaning into that. Well, the, a growth industry could be like reusable, washable fashion masks. Well, I mean, that, I'm going to start, stock, well, I, you can't stockpile masks because because there aren't any to be purchased. But if one could, I would I would do that. I mean, a really effective yeah. one would basically just get a pair of pantyhose, cut them in half, stick them over your head, but then everyone thinks you're a bank robber and you get shot. <laughs> I mean, look at this. We're giving all sorts of do-it-yourself tips exactly. here. I mean, this is a full, is full, full service yes. podcast. Do you, uh, one thing that I've also been thinking of, and again, the political side of things, is whether the, when it comes to the US, so I'm just now buying into the fear, is how the Trump administration handles it and whether or not they are able to handle it in a way that is calm and measured. I, I mean, you just you're just kind of waiting for the wave to hit in terms of their response to it, and whether that exposes them to political vulnerabilities in the campaign season. So it, it's an. I mean, again, we don't know, but you know, I've seen reports talking about this as Trump's black swan moment, yeah, right? Yeah. But to what extent is he going to be held responsible for what could be a global problem? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And you can say, yeah, well, he bungled the response. Well, you know, they bungled the response to Katrina. There was a bit of a political price that got paid, but arguably that was a wounded administration anyway. So, you know, we'll see how these things pan out. What's much more relevant, of course, is, and we'll get to this eventually, uh, how the Democratic field is shaping up in terms of getting someone to take on Trump in November. that is true, yeah. But we'll burn that bridge when we come to it. In the meantime, (laughs) let's go from viruses to... Predators, and that would be that would be Harvey Weinstein, oh my uh, who was just sentenced, um, in, and still in has New to York. face more charges in LA. Yes, that's right. Thank you. How do you get jailed in two places? I don't know. Does he end up in Nebraska? That'd be the worst case for him, right? That totally to be would in the be. heartland. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In a supermax. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, and they didn't give him the the life sentence, but he got a very high sentence. So oh, I, what was his final sentence? I don't it, know. I, like, oh, now I'm going to misquote it. Uh, I'm looking at our engineers and producers, if we remember. I think it's it's. In I didn't the think they did top sen- twenty years, really fifteen did- to eighteen, something like that. When did they do the sentencing? Was it yesterday? I think it was just... They didn't or, do the actual sentence. That was a recommendation. Oh, it's a recommendation. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. right, fine. Yeah, um, right. On one hand, you're, you feel like there was some movement in the Me Too movement. And yet, on the other hand, you think, you, why this person who has so much evidence, or at least in the public sphere, so much evidence against him, why he didn't get the maximum penalty? Um, and what will sort of happen with both the movement and then him in Los Angeles as well? So, you know, he's a sexual predator. He, the evidence is overwhelming. Yeah. You know, he got what was coming, et cetera, et cetera, right? But there's an interesting kind of legal conundrum in all of this, which is, you know, you can call it the court of public opinion, but we can really nail this down a little bit uh, more precisely. You're charged for specific wrongdoing, right? So the people who came forward, who testified mm-hmm. against him, that's what he was charged on. If you're basically chucking things that are known, things that are likely, it is kind of hearsay. Yeah, especially right? the, especially one of the women, yeah. So yeah. here's, you know, the, the problem, not just for the Me Too movement or whatever, but for this kind of, if you will, how can I put it, um, 
campaign style of justice. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. The, there's overwhelming evidence of. No, there is. But in a court of law, there has to be specific evidence yeah. of. And it's not that I worry about this necessarily. I mean, you know, the guy had it coming. Yeah. And, you know, this is a, a terrible set of crimes and, and it should be correct, you know, prosecuted as such. But there is that question, and you're going to see this in the appeal. Mm -hmm. And that's where it'd be interesting where this goes, right? To what extent is there sort of overreach beyond the specifics of a trial? Yes, of that specific case and not for all the other stuff that, that's exactly. out there. Exactly. I mean, I often wonder, and this is, I don't know, I mean, and this is something I, I think about, you know, with my, and talk about my friends, is that we have such a cancel culture right now. And so taking away from Harvey Weinstein, because it's so clear that what he did was illegal and, and, and everything. But for the, for the people who are accused, we just get rid of them. And so we're, I, I don't know what that cycle should look like or what that should look like in terms of rehabilitation, in terms of learning. I don't, and I think, I wish that we would talk more about that as opposed to just, you know, saying, well, so-and-so got fired and we just move on. Right. Because there's more to it. I don't know what that is. Well, you know, the cancel culture exactly there. I mean, you see this at universities, right? Someone invites someone who's controversial, yes, who contravenes right. kind of mainstream opinion, and there's all hell to pay. Yes. And this person should be canceled. And it's like, well, you know, you just, you don't need to go. I mean, you know, look. I often find these things are a bit weird. I mean, if somebody's deeply offensive and they come to talk at your university, don't go. Yeah. And then they'll have five weirdos in a room, which is what usually happens to these people, as opposed to huge amounts of publicity That's right. that turns them into media Or markers. ask a really tough question. Right, I mean, exactly. show up and add, have done your due right. diligence and ask a tough question. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The whole sort of, you know, just I'm not dealing with that. That can't come near me. This is my safe space. Yeah. I yeah. don't think that is actually very productive at the end of the day for the very causes people are trying That's to That's exactly right. And the and the solution is they just, people just get fired, which I think they should be fired in a lot of cases but what's there's something dot 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 after that and i don't think we're just we're just not ready to really think about that in a policy way to actually lay out what on an hr side pr uh, private entities or at the government level what all of this actually absolutely should look everyone's like. yeah. just hunkering down and trying to avoid yeah. rather than dealing with yeah. it well hunkering down <laughs> brings me to another interesting topic and that is our president recently went to delhi to meet with the indian prime minister modi and yes was at a huge the largest cricket stadium in the world 110,000 people showed up, really excited to see the president, and then afterwards went out to set some cars on fire. Hey. Um, yeah, because, you know, that's that's what, no, I, I say that in jest, and I shouldn't have said that in jest, but there were uh, s several protests p following the... Um, been, there's been a lot of protests in India. Yeah. Can you tell us why there's been a lot of protests in it India? It seems like the prime minister is doing some rather controversial things. Like who counts as a citizen and who doesn't? Yes. Yeah. Who yes. else is doing that? I don't know. Maybe President of the United States. Yeah, it's funny. Do you think maybe they had a kind of like, let's decide who's in the club and who's not? Yeah. My club is filled with Hindu nationalists. Yes. Your club is filled with, I don't know, who's in Trump's club? I Well, I would guess I would say white nationalists. Yeah, but it's also, you know, rich people. Yes. Rich English speaking right. people. Yeah. Rich English speaking, speaking yep. people with skills. Yeah. Which sounds a lot like what the Brits are trying to do huh. with their immigration well, look policies. Look at you connecting all these dots. Look at that. Isn't <laughs> it amazing? Yeah. I mean, it becomes a question of degree. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what, you know, basically they're sort of saying that Muslims are not citizens of India when there are 400 million of them that are an integral part of every community. That's the most extreme case. But you can filter this back through Stephen Miller's immigration reforms. Oh, 100%. You can filter this back to basically what the, the Brits are doing with uh, their immigration yeah. reforms. And, you know, this goes back to this thing which I, I find fascinating. If you read the work of immigration scholars, the mm -hmm. one thing that they'll tell you is that immigration has never been popular. No, that's right. it's uh, never no. been popular. I mean, and, the history and, of the US. Yeah, exactly. But history of everywhere. And uh, you know, so, you know, the Irish had a terrible time when they came to yeah. Scotland and, and in the 50s and 60s when there's a lot of Irish migration to London. They just had, uh, you know, rooms to let, no Irish. Yeah, right. right. I mean, everywhere, right? That sort right. of stuff, right? Catholics were discriminated against. I mean, it's always been problematic. And, you know, we're still in this bizarre, I think, kind of miasma whereby a whole bunch of sort of particularly liberal elites but not exclusively mm -hmm. liberal elites, convinced themselves in the 1990s that immigration was awesome. Mm -hmm. And that everybody thought that way. And they still seem to be genuinely shocked that when you basically push immigration policy in a very cosmopolitan and open direction, there's a backlash. Yeah. 
Yep. Whereas if you look at this historically, that is absolutely yep. normal. I mean, on the U.S. side of things, I mean, ag- to your point about academic immigration scholars or whatever the term is I'm trying to think of. People who write about this stuff you. professionally. Yes, <laughs> is that it, the U.S. is a gatekeeper nation. It, ha- it had, Policy has always been about keeping people out and not in. I mean, this is from the very beginning, from 17 whenever. And so for us to think, to your point, that somehow we've been this open-armed nation is just not historically accurate. And so, so much legislation proves uh, proves that point. We didn't talk about in January when the president came out with six more countries on the travel ban. So, I mean, just more evidence of like the similarities between their the Modi and the Trump policies. Absolutely. And it yeah. filters all the way through to, you know, the Brits now have this kind of skill test. You have to get 70 points. Do and you? Yeah, you get 10. So basically the, their targeted worker who gets 70 points is that you get 10 points for speaking English. Yeah. You get 20 points for having a PhD in a STEM subject. So good luck with that because wow. that's about 0.4% of the population. Yeah, I was going right? to say, even nobody. No, yeah, exactly, right. Yeah. And uh, then, you know, there's various other things. You get points or whatever, and yeah. adds up to 70. They've dropped the sort of the w- prevailing wage requirement, which is to say you don't like, you can't come in unless you earn 50 grand. It's not, it's like 20 something. I forget yeah. exactly what it is. So there's some ways in which they're kind of being accommodating, but the focus is very, very clear. And it's very similar to what the United States is essentially saying, which is if you're unskilled, and if you're not an English speaker, or at least you're, you know, from a country where, or an education background where that is normalised, uh, then don't try. It, but isn't the UK also struggling with population decrease? They are all struggling with this. I mean, this like, is the like, Italians, like, literally, and and about two hundred years there'll be no Italians left. Right? The well, they're the ones so, giving homes away for a dollar. Right, exactly. And yeah. at the same time, the the politicians that are raking it all in, the ones yeah. weaponizing this stuff, right? You know, the, the right-wing populists, yeah. they're like, oh, immigration is this, you know, this huge issue. And people think it is this huge issue, and we should take it seriously. Right. But the fact of the matter is they're running out of people. Now, now <laughs> I say that's... this until I'm blue in the face, right? An economy is nothing more than the number of workers, the number of hours worked, uh-huh. multiplied by the amount of capital they've got. Right. Yeah. Now, if you're Japan, you can increase the capital quotient and try and get robots for everything, but it doesn't work. And if you're not Japan and you're Italy, you're not going to try that one. So you're going to shrink. So if your economy shrinks relative to your stock of debt, for yeah. example, your debts yeah. go up. Right. Your growth slows. Right. You need productivity yeah. enhancement yeah. because you're running out of workers. All these people are old. You need young people coming in and you didn't have your own. Therefore, you have yes. to have migrants. And every bit of politics everywhere in the world is going exactly in the other direction. Well, and then COVID strikes and you have, I mean, you're just a population that has no workers and... No well, in, in, in fairness, if this goes the way that, you know, the, the, the disaster scenario, yeah. then uh, the let's say the quotient of older people is going to be yes. reduced. Yes, that's a much more diplomatic way of saying the word. Exactly. I was um, and the, but hey, here's another transition for you, Blythe. Go is on, that, you're on a roll. Yeah, is that there's a lot of people now needing jobs out of the Trump administration. Yes, they are. Fires aren't they? people galore. Yes. L- lots and lots of uh, career bureaucrats. Yes. Basically, have seen the writing on the wall post impeachment, and then they've hired this like I think he's 28, 29 year old <laughs> ex quarterback. Uh, good looking young guy. Yeah. Um, to basically Robust. come in and fire everyone who's not a loyalist. Yeah. So we're now gutting expertise in the executive branch on the grounds of political loyalty at a time when expertise, despite what everybody thinks of experts, you might need them when there's a combined, basically, global warming plus virus pandemics going on around the world. I wonder if they have to take a test similar to the UK test, like, do you speak Trump speak, you know, like that that sort of stuff. But I mean, certainly the the purge post-impeachment, you're exactly right, firing people. And yet I was reminded that this is not new, of course. Obama fired Just McChrystal. Just like the immigration stuff, right? right. I mean, right, We've everything's been here a cycle. Before. Not, but, to, not to normalize it. It, right, has, its own, it right. has its own flavor. But he's not the first person to do this. No, and I mean, yes, we like wring our hands, but it's certainly there is, I mean, people, CEOs, we'll talk about Michael Bloomberg in a second. I mean, people do this a lot. And again, not to normalize it, but this is done at in, from the executive yeah, branch Johnson too. Johnson was a lunatic. The minute he was appointed <laughs> president, yeah. he basically fired everyone he yes. thought was a Kennedy loyalist. Yes. Yep. Nixon was legendarily paranoid. Yeah. And quite rightly, because they yes. really were out to get him. Yes. And he replaced loads of people. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, guess what? But LBJ, well, I mean, total paranoia as well. I mean, he really felt like he was under attack from all the Kennedy. Yes, because well. he was. Yes, exactly. 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 They really were out to, sometimes yeah. they really are out to get yeah, you. That, that's true. And he, well, I mean, he utterly humiliated people in public for this reason. I heard this. I, I heard this from someone who swore it was true. You know, he used to make them swim naked in front of him. 
Uh, yes, I yeah. Yeah. So 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 next time we're talking about Trump's a crazy man, yeah. right? I don't think the new guy that's running yeah. employment at the White House is saying, right, everybody, skinny dip swim test. Just to pull on this a tiny bit more, he used to hold meetings while he was on the toilet. And to with his vice president, with Humphrey, he, and this is a well-known story of making him recite a speech while and bring him into the bathroom while and have Humphrey recite the speech. So this is, that's, I that's mean, Johnson epic. was a whole nother, a whole nother level. Um, and I don't, here we go. One more transition. Go on then. From Johnson, Johnson. and all his uh, his craziness to the Democratic primary. Wait, which speaking, is, <laughs> speaking of Democratic of presidents who give up the ghost. Yes. I don't even know what to say. I mean, I have tried to watch Did the Did you debates. enjoy yesterday's blood fest? So here's the thing. So I watched the one in Vegas for 30 seconds and mm. turned it off because it was like watching my mom and dad fight. It was so uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, the infighting, the circus, the yelling, the the everything. And, you know, everyone's trying to slow down Bernie in whatever ways that they that they can. I mean, I think the, the Pete, the clearly, clear, clear, clear dislike between Amy and Pete is kind of an interesting sub story but i it's just hard to know and then michael bloomberg comes into the debate for the first but, but time the Amy and pete one it's a bit like when you watched happy days and then they gave chachi a show you know you knew this was a, like a subplot i mean yes, it's, it's yeah. really not that interesting no you know? and i think people th- feel exactly like i should be more interested than i actually and, and yeah. uh, you're more interested in that than the, you know the slug fest of yes. grandparents yes which is that's going right on as the main well you're event. interested in it and then you start to read one paragraph and you're like no i'm not so interested so, so he, i mean if, if we have anything semi-serious to say about this one i mean I, th- I think it goes something like this i wonder if there's a kind of never trump never bernie comparison to be made I think so. And I think also, I mean, you know, I, you know, Twitter, who knows how accurate this is, but the people who say that they're either Bernie or Trump, and you're just like, I just don't ideologically get that. It's not representative. There was actually a study done, a very deep study of basically Bernie support oh, a couple yeah. of weeks ago. Yeah. And it's all tropes. Go to uh, Matthias 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 uh, oh, posted yeah. it on Twitter, okay. so you can have a look at it. And yeah. it's an in-depth study, and basically they're all bros. They think it's no, absolutely not. It's yeah. actually majority women. Yeah. He actually has huh. very solid Latinos. So a lot of that really is yeah. a trope, right? But it's a very good trope to weaponize if you want to derail Bernie. No, it's it's really effective. Yeah, and I, I I guess what's the takeaway, and where where are we right now? It just seems like it's all it's muddled, but Bernie is clearly ahead ahead of everybody. <laughs> But this is the whole thing about the Never Trumpers. So imagine it was back in the you know the Republican primaries in 2016. So you've got Jeb exclamation mark right. <laughs> yeah. You have got all these people coming. Ted Cruz. It's fine. Yeah. This is just noise. Trump isn't serious. Whatever. And then by the time they figured out that he was really doing it, there was no one to coalesce behind. Yeah. Now it was meant to be yeah. Biden. That's over. Right. Yes. And Bloomberg fancies himself as the white knight coming in to save the mainstream of the party, but I'm not sure that that one's working. And then Buttigieg, as ever, just looks like some kind of like mad science experiment made up by McKinsey. Yeah. And then, you know, sort of invested on the American public. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there could be a kind of never Bernie moment. Now, of course, this is if you like these policies, which yeah. I do, whatever is very yeah. interesting, right? But I told you about this thing called American Tribes, right? Yes. So there's a website, I think it's called American Tribes. Dot com, you can go check it out. And basically, you do a kind of survey of what your political preferences are. Okay. So I did mine, yeah. just kind of honestly, and I came out as a Cold War <laughs> liberal, so maybe this is not <laughs> quite accurate. But then I, I cleared the cache and I went yeah. in again, and I basically said, I wonder what happens if I just do full-on yeah. Bernie, right? Yeah, yeah. So I ticked all the boxes that would do this. Now, what this thing does is millions of people have done this thing, right? Now, assume that a third of them are bots and take that. Mm-hmm. We've still got a huge sample. Yeah. And it basically gives you a good statistical picture on estimate of how many people have these preferences, yeah. right? So if you go full Bernie on that website, yeah. 11% of the American population share these preferences. Yeah. Now, there's lots it's of tough. poll data that John yeah. was talking about earlier yeah. that, you know, 55% of people actually do want Medicare for or whatever, right? But just going by that, it makes me wonder if there's a kind of Corbyn thing here. Yes. Which yeah. is, you know, these policies sound really popular, but then when you put them up with a controversial person yep. who's perceived to be weak on other areas and their own party's out to get them. I mean, remember there was the yes, anti-Semitism yes. stuff or whatever. Yep. They're going to do exactly the same thing with Bernie. It won't be anti-Semitism, but the mainstream of the party is going to try and take them down. Yeah. Yep. You know, could that, t- that that kind of scenario play out again? Well, and I, th- I don't, so there's two things out of what you just said. So one of the things is the messaging of the Sanders campaign, which is 
not not great. I mean, Medicare for all, what does this mean? And then he gets a tag saying he, the calculations are off by a trillion billion dollars. And I think there's something to be said for a really simple message of like, we just want to give quality health care and like leave it vague, at least for the moment. And then the second thing is, is that he's not doing himself any favors. Like I haven't even watched the 60 minute clips, but they've been all over Twitter. And so you hear Bernie, Cuba, good. And you think, oh God, communism, terrible, socialism, terrible. And so you just think, just do yourself some favors here, Bernie, and exactly. not put that Don't, stuff yeah. out I mean, there. look, it's absolutely true that in terms of basic health care coverage is all the way through to cancer care. Cuba, despite the blockade on medicine, yeah. right, had better health outcomes than the Americans of equivalent socioeconomic status. Right. right, absolutely true. Doesn't mean it's your model, right? Right, that doesn't mean you need to go there on that one because it's just a huge open goal. The way I think it should play it is very simple: is just whenever he's asked, "Well, this is how it's going to cost a fortune, whatever," just say, "How come nobody ever stops and says?" Hang on a minute. When a president wants to invade a country and and kill th- hundreds of thousands of people, and it ends up costing four trillion dollars, mm-hmm. we find the money for uh, that. Such a good point. Uh, yep. You know, whenever the banks go bust, when yep. we have to save rich people's assets, yep. billions, trillions, yes. yep. not a problem. We'll print money for yep. it, and we still seem to be fine afterwards. Yes. Yep. But the minute you want to do anything for ordinary Americans, yeah. oh, forget it. That's terrible. Yep. And it's the, his own party which is making this argument, which yeah. just makes it doubly disgusting. I mean, and I, you just can't, it's hard to see, especially for a Bernie-like figure, if you think of those who have become presidents, that whether you're on the right or the left, there's something about them that's inspirational and they try to unify the party in some way. And like just the, you know, just the tearing down of the candidates, you just think how, does do any of them bring the party together in some way? And can any of them inspire voters, the 10,000, the two voters that we need to mobilize to the polls in November? I just think... How did we get to where we are with the slate of candidates, too? And there does, I mean... Well, if you think about it, they represent what the Democratic Party has become, right? Yeah. You have, literally have a Harvard professor. Yes. Right, who have been running <laughs> the... Pol- they've yeah. been running the policy stuff. Harvard Law, stuff. actually. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Exactly. They've been writing the policy stuff for 25 years, right? Yeah. Um, who else have we got? We've got a McKinsey consultant. Yes. We've got a billionaire guy who made his money in finance. Yes. Right. We've got the guy who invented internal tax dodging in the state of Delaware, yes. much to the yeah. detriment of the fiscal stances of every state in the United States, yeah. a.k.a. Joe Biden. Right. Yeah. I mean, th- this, this is who this party is. Don't be surprised. Yeah. They're, they're not angels. No. And I guess your point of that, there's no there's no actual consistency in terms of ideology. There is no I mean, everybody is just kind of hanging out there yeah. with no unit you know, with no middle. At the end of the yeah. day, it's come down to this. My billionaire is nicer than your billionaire. Oh, I know. He tells better jokes. Yeah, exactly. Um, we always try to end on something a little bit lighter. Is there exactly. Any, is there anything light to end on? So I'll recommend a TV show. Oh, good. Thank yeah. you. Uh, it's about the end of the world. Oh, good. <laughs> Very appropriate. <laughs> so it's uh, Michael Sheen and uh, what's his name again? The Scottish actor who acted Doctor Who a couple while ago. Um, oh, blank on his name. Anyway, it's called Good Omens. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's an Amazon okay. series. Oh, okay. And it's about the end of the world. Yeah. And a teenage antichrist. Yeah. And it's it's all it's, appropriate it's six topics. hours, six yeah. six uh, things. Hilarious. Okay. Really brilliant. Wonderfully acted. Dead fun. Totally okay. recommend it. Good Omens. Okay, I'm gonna watch that because we need some Good Omens. Yes, please. I've been watching to live out my fantasy of a female leader. Mm-hmm. Uh, Borgen is the Danish. It's oh, old yeah. now, but I just I don't know. Give me hope for the future that one day we'll actually, in the United States at least, put a woman in the White House. Yes, but also the other thing of Borgen is it's always raining. Yes, it's very Danish. It's very, it's very Danish. Yeah. Everybody's very serious all yes. day. Not, not a bottle of laughs. No, but no. they are all bicycling. So I feel That's like this is a good message for climate, for climate change. So we'll, we'll, we will close with um, an angel and a demon working together to stop Armageddon and bicycles. Yeah, that's a great message. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Talk to you next time.